Hello everybody and welcome to today's lesson. We're going to continue our discussion talking about induced stresses, but today we're going to talk about area loads with our elastic methods and induced stresses. Uh, by way of review, let's uh, just talk a little bit about what we discussed last time. So if I just take a section of the ground drawn here in three dimensions, Here's the ground surface. Let's say that uh, we have a point load, a single load that's applied to an infinitesimally small point on the ground surface. We know that that will extend out at a certain radius and affect the ground at some particular depth that we'll say is Z. And so it's going to have some a level of stress associated with it at that particular depth from that point load. So we talked about point loads. We also talked about, I will erase some stuff here. We also talked about the possibility of instead of point loads, what if we had a line load? So, whoops, imagine if we had a line along the ground surface on which our stresses were situated and that just went on forever and ever. It was an infinite line load. So similarly, you can picture then that at some depth, this line load is going to distribute its stresses down and it's going to be even in all directions, um, meaning that there's going to be a zone of influence at any given point down beneath the ground surface. We talked about how with the line load, we said that there is going to be um, strain and stress in the X direction. But we said that in the Y direction, that there is going to be zero strain, but there will be definitely stress. Um, let me, let me um, write that in a better, more clear way. There we go. So when we have zero strain in the direction of the infinite loading, we call that the plane strain assumption. And again, as a reminder, uh, the reason it can't strain in the y direction is because every every element beneath the load is trying to strain in the same time, the same direction, in the y direction. So they all cancel each other out. So there is no strain in that y direction. And that's why we call it a plane strain assumption. Cool. So. Uh, what are we going to talk about today? Well, it's going to be a simple... Oh, one last one I forgot to mention. Uh, we talked about line loads, but we also talked about the possibility of having what we call a strip load. So this would be, for instance, like a whole bunch of line loads stretched or, or spread across an infinite uh, direction in the Y, but a finite distance in the X. And we call the width of that load B. And we know that the strip load will create a zone of influence as well beneath it. We talked a little bit about what we call isobars. And you recall that isobars are just the solution to the elastic equations where all we're doing is we're computing 
the stress bulb beneath our load. So if the load that we've applied to the soil is what we call Q, then we can have different levels of um, what we call um, influence factors. And this is what the isobar is giving us. So we might have 10% of Q, we might have um, you know, 30% of Q, we might have you know, 50% of Q, and so on and so forth, right up until we get to like, you know, 90% uh, of Q. And so all these are, are just indicators of how much stre additional stress the soil is feeling from the induced load that we apply to the ground surface. Now, a couple of things to remember about our assumption when we're using the Boussinet um, elastic methods. You'll recall that we're assuming the soil is isotropic, meaning that the elastic modulus in the x direction is the same as the elastic modulus in the y direction, is the same as the elastic modulus in the z direction. They all equal each other. As a result of this, what this means is that in the Boussinet solutions, there, um, there is no modulus term. The modulus cancels out. So what that means is that when I apply the Boussinet equations, it does not matter what type of soil I have. Whether I have a gravel, whether I have a clay, whether I have a sand, it doesn't matter. I'm going to get the same computed induced stresses from the Boussinet method. So one of the advantages to that, of course, is that I really don't need to know anything about my actual soil conditions to <coughs> estimate what the induced stresses would be from some load I'm applying to the ground surface. We're also going to assume that the soil is homogeneous. And we're going to assume that the soil is elastic. And so these are some pretty big assumptions that we're making. Um, but we find that well, all of these assumptions generally lead us to a conservative solution, meaning that the, the induced stresses we're computing from these approaches tend to be a little bit larger than they actually are in real life, which is good. Okay. So we're going to continue our discussion of in computing induced stresses with the Boussinet elastic methods, but we're going to now look at some more sophisticated geometries of the load, not just line loads, not just strip loads, but we're going to look at um, different shapes of loads as well as some flexible methods that you can apply to get some really unique uh, load shapes for induced stresses. So uh, here's a nice little uh, slide I put together to show you the solutions for a circular area. If you're just interested in points beneath the center of the circle, then you can approximate those solutions, the change in vertical stress using this equation here that I've circled. Notice that this isn't an exact solution, it's an approximation from uh, Professor Harry Poulos down in Australia. Um, if we want to solve the isobar solution, there's only one isobar, and that's going to be this plot right here, that we can get the increase in our vertical stress beneath the center of our circular load. Why the center? Well, because that is typically where the stress for the circular load is the greatest. The more we move out towards the edges, the less the stress is going to become. So in this particular instance, remember um, this solution here of, of the increase in stress over our original Q, that's what we call I or our influence factor. So we can see that typically the zone of significant stress 
as we defined it in the last lesson, is going to be anywhere from 20% to 10%. So it's going to be about, you know, from here to here, which means that our uh, the depth that we're interested in as geotechnical engineers is anywhere between um, two and a half times the radius to three and a half times the radius in terms of depth below the ground surface. So if I'm dealing with a water tank that has a 50 foot radius, uh, immediately I'm talking about um, like 125 feet to, to <laughs> I can't do the math in my head right now, three and a half times 50 feet, um, which you can see can be a significant depth below the ground surface. And so uh, that would help guide you to know how deep you ought to put your geotechnical borings into the ground to uh, classify and characterize the soil beneath your site. Now, what if you want a point that is not beneath the center of the load? And that's okay. Um, maybe we were interested at a point beneath the edge of, whoops, beneath the edge of our load, or maybe we're interested in the induced stress at some point outside the footprint of the circular load. In that particular case, we can use this equation right here, where our influence factor is going to be a function of some A prime and some B prime. And we can get those from our tables 10.6 and 10.7 in our DOS textbook for the class. Okay, well, what if I have a square load? So this might be a square footing or something like that. If that's the case, then um, we can use the solution that's shown here. Uh, here is the isobar solution for a square load. Uh, you can see, again, if I'm looking at the 10% to 20% in general, our depth of our zone of significant stress is anywhere uh, from one and a half times the width to two times the width uh, down below the footing. That's going to be the zone where the soil is really going to compress and feel the stress from the load that we're applying. Now, I want to point out something here. So let's stop and let's do a conceptual thinking minute. The zone of significant stress that we talked about in the last lesson, lesson 13 on um, strip loads, said that the zone of significant stress was anywhere uh, between depths of three to seven times the footing width. But this is only one and a half to two times the footing width, even if the width itself is the same as the width of a strip footing. So what's the difference here? Why is the zone of significant stress so much deeper for a strip footing or so much less for a square footing? Well, the answer is that the square footing's um, dimension in this y-axis here is finite. It's not infinite, which means that we do not have the plane strain condition. So what we talked about before, where all of the soil beneath the infinite load was trying to strain the same amount, and so it canceled each other out, that does not apply with this finite square uniform load, which means that the soil can strain in the y direction, as well as have stress, as, as it can strain in the x direction and have stress in the x direction as well. So uh, because of that, our stresses do not get as distributed or do not get distributed as deep into the soil as they would with an infinite load. Now, if we're interested in just a point directly beneath the center of our square load, and we're not worried about this other stuff out here beneath uh, or outside the footprint, then we can use this approximation equation from Poulos which is really convenient and handy. But again, remember, this is just for beneath the center of the square footing. 
All right. <clears throat> so what do we do if we have um, a non-square load? Or what do we do if I have a crazy looking load? Like say a load that might look something like this. I'm looking down in plan view. You might say, holy cow, how in the world am I going to compute the stresses beneath uh, a load that looks something like this? Well, the point would be, or something that we may want to do, is what if we could break this into a whole bunch of shapes that we could handle and, and find a way then to use superposition to add the stresses from each of these shapes together to get the desired shape that we want. So Boussinet gave us a wonderful tool. And what it is, is it's a methodology to, com to compute or estimate the stresses below the corner. And I want to emphasize this. This is below the corner. Whoops. Not the center, the corner of a uniformly loaded rectangular area. So here's the corner of the rectangle, and we are now beneath the corner of it. We call this influence factor, at least DOS calls it I sub 3. I'm not sure what the 3 means, but to be consistent with the terminology in the book, I'll show it here. I sub 3 is a pretty beefy equation here that we can compute. Where M and N are functions of the length L and the width B of our rectangular area. Now remember, as we mentioned before, L is always the long side of the rectangle and B is always the short side or the short dimension of the rectangle. So all we're going to do is take Q, the uniform load of the rectangle, and multiply it by this influence factor. And that will tell us the increase in stress at any point below the corner of our rectangle at some specified depth Z. If we don't want to compute this equation, that's fine. There are uh, canned solutions for I sub 3 in table 10.9 of your textbook. Or you can use isobar charts like this where we can see there's the influence factor on that axis. On this axis we have M and then on this axis or on each of these contour lines we have different values of N. So you just match up your computed M with your computed N and go to the appropriate line and come over and interpolate your value uh, for your influence factor. So with those isobars in hand, um, you can use the equations or just graphically get your solutions to get your stresses beneath the corner of your rectangle. Now, how could this possibly be useful for more complex or, or useful uh, or more realistic footings? Well, for instance, what if we were to look at a footing uh, that was shaped like an elbow here? So yeah, this is a very real, realistic footing. This might be beneath the corner of a structure or something like that. And say that we're interested in computing the stresses beneath this uh, corner elbow of the footing. Well, it's labeled point A. And we want to compute the induced stresses at a depth of 50 feet below point A if the uniform stress across this, this loaded area was equal to 1,000 pounds per square foot. Okay, so let's use Boussinet rectangles to solve this problem. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to try to find a combination of rectangles from which point A falls beneath the corner of all of them. So what I can do is uh, I just basically draw two lines here, shown in gray, to divide this corner footing up into three different rectangles. Rectangle 1, Rectangle 2, Rectangle 3. And you'll see that point A falls on the corner 
of all three. Not the center. No, we're not beneath the center of any of these rectangles. Please do not be computing stresses beneath the center of the rectangles. It's beneath the corner. Okay, so once we do that, all we need to do is come up with our different units. So let's look at the rectangle number one. If I look at these dimensions here, I can see that uh, my long dimension is going to simply be 100 feet minus 25 feet, which is going to give me 75 feet for L. And B is simply going to equal 50 feet. So if I come over to my calculations here, I can say B equals 50 feet. My depth was given in my problem, 50 feet below the ground surface. So that gives me a value of one for M. And for N, I'm going to throw 75 in for L and I get a value of 1.5 for uh, my N value. Now, what I would do with one for M or 1.5 for N, let me go backwards. So I'm going to go to a value of one for M and I'm going to go up, go up, go up until I get to 1.5 for N. So let's see, there's 1.4, there's 1.8. So it's going to be somewhere right around here is my guess. Where I would have a, a contour line that corresponded to N of 1.5. So I'm going to come over here. And it looks to me like um, I am probably around 0 0.19. Let's see if that's 0.19, probably 0.197 maybe, something like that. I mean, you don't need to be absolutely precise, but you know, we wanna be in the ballpark. So from that chart, or if I go to table 10.8 in my text, I get, oh, look at that, very precise, 0.1935, really, really good, okay. For area number two, I'm going to compute M of, uh, I need to get my width B and that's going to be 25 feet in this particular instance for rectangle number two. And my L, this dimension here is simply going to be 100 feet minus 50 feet, which will be 50 feet. So then I could go back to the figure uh, that we had on the earlier slide. In fact, why don't we just do that? I'm not in a rush. Of course, I wanna make sure I get the numbers right. M of 0 0.5, N of one. So M of 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, oops. So here's M of 0.5 and I'm going to an N value of one. So up I come, up I come until I get to one, which is right here where those intersect. And that will correspond, just estimating, it looks to me more like uh, 0 0.125 ish maybe. So let's see what we get here. Oops, I don't know why I'm zooming in. 0 0.120, okay. So my interpolation skills aren't very good with my eyeball, but you get the idea. So what I want you to do, um, number three, you're going to notice Rectangle number three is the exact same dimensions as rectangle number two. 25 and 50 uh, for L or B and L respectively. So we get the same values of M, which means that we're going to compute the exact same influence factor. So now I have the influence factors for rectangle one, rectangle two, and rectangle three. We can use superposition 
to add those influence factors together. And that's from rectangle one, from rectangle two, and rectangle three. Add them together and multiply them by Q. And that will give me my vertical induced stress at a depth of 50 feet below point A. So you can see how that works. And at no point did we ask what the soil type was, uh, what its elastic modulus was. This is how the A elastic solutions work. So here's a fun little challenge for you. Um, what I want you to do is uh, let's start with this first rectangle here. Let's say that I have the same elbow footing, but this time I want the stresses beneath point B on the outside corner of the elbow there. I want you to pause this video and I want you uh, on your notes to think how you would draw uh, the Boussinet rectangles to estimate the stresses beneath that uh, point B. Now remember, the trick here is that point B needs to fall on the same corner of all the rectangles. Um, it can't fall beneath the center and it doesn't make sense to have it fall beneath different corners of different rectangles. So how do you draw your rectangles to line up such that the same corner uh, applies to all of the different rectangles? And a hint that you may want to consider is remember you can subtract the stresses from rectangles as well. So pause this video, take a few minutes and see if you can draw your rectangles such that you could get the stresses beneath point B. Go. Okay, so hopefully you're back. And you had an opportunity to uh, practice a little bit with those rectangles. Here's what I did and see if you got the same solution. So the first thing I did was I drew a rectangle that I'm going to call area one, and it looks something like this. Then I'm going to take uh, another rectangle, and I'm going to call that area two. And I still get point B that falls beneath the corner, and it's the same corner of area one. So the corners overlap, so that's great. So the influence factor from rectangle two would equal I sub three for area two. But here's the problem. We double counted this area. We have two rectangles now that overlap. And so we have to correct for the fact that we double counted it. So I can draw a third rectangle that I'm gonna call area three. Notice that its corner lines up with areas one and two. And all I need to do then is subtract the influence factor um, from it so that we can get the stresses, the induced stresses uh, beneath point B. Great, so now let's do the same little activity. I want you to pause the presentation again, but this time I want you to find the rectangles we would need to compute the stresses beneath point B if point B was outside the footprint of this rectangular load. Go. Okay, welcome back. Hopefully you had a chance to practice that. Let's see if you got the same solution that I did. So the first thing I did was I drew a big imaginary rectangle and I called it area one. Then the next thing I did was I had to subtract out the stress from this area where there is no actual load. So I drew a second rectangle, area two, and notice again, the corners of the rectangles overlap right at point B. That's the trick, folks. Get the corners of your rectangles to line up over the point of interest. If you can do that, then you can compute your stresses successfully. I'm gonna subtract the influence factor from that second rectangle to get me the stresses beneath point B. So hopefully uh, that activity is a little more clear for you. So uh, moving on, what if we have a different shape uh, or a different low geometry? A very common low geometry is that of an embankment. 
So if I go back to my whiteboard, here's the ground surface. What if we were building a new highway embankment or a new dam or a new levee? And I want to know the stresses beneath that embankment or that dam. And um, it's very similar, you could say, to like a rectangular load, except that we have the corners lopped off. And so, of course, um, we can account for that by using what we call a ramp load or uh, an embankment load. So here is the Boussinet solution for an embankment load. And this solution is um, organized according to the geometry that you see, where this letter A represents the horizontal distance of the ramp. So that's the portion of the load where the load is increasing linearly until it reaches some constant crest load which might represent the top of the embankment or something like that. So um, A gives us the dimension of the ramp. B gives us the dimension along the top of the crest. Now the Boussinet solution gives us the increase in the vertical induced stresses beneath or at a point beneath the edge of the crest so check this out folks it's like the load is going 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 and then the load just stops right there and beneath that point is where our point of interest lies so that's the geometry to use um, these solutions now there are um, algebraic solutions that we can use but I prefer just to use the isobars for uh, these ramp loads. And you can see that uh, everything is organized according to geometry. So on this axis, the x-axis down here, we compute A divided by the depth, where the depth again is below the ground surface beneath the bottom of our um, embankment load. And then uh, the different contour lines are simply B, or the, the width of our crest load, divided by the depth below uh, the, the bottom of our load. So again, we, f we get our value of A over Z, get our value of B over Z, and we come up and we interpolate then our influence factor I for this particular ramp load. Once we have I, we multiply it by the Q, or the magnitude of the load. And you may say, well, what, what is Q? In this notation Q is simply the height of these arrows here and it is equal to the unit weight of the material times that physical height of the material so it, it's basically just like a, a horizontal or I'm sorry a vertical stress computed for the field or material that we're placing on the ground unit weight times height that's how we get this Q and it's by the way H is going to be the height beneath the crest okay not the height on the ramp it's got to be the height beneath the, the crest of our embankment and that's how we get our induced vertical stress uh, beneath an embankment load. But some of you are probably thinking, wait a second, Dr. Frankie, this doesn't make sense to me because I've never seen an embankment that looks like this. This looks like half an embankment. Where's the other half that goes over here? Where's that other half? Well, again, this is just efficiency because if we can get the solution for this half embankment that's colored here then all we need to do is essentially double the solution if we wanted to get beneath the center of the real embankment that would cover the embankment that was over here on the other side 
But what if we not we are not beneath the center of the embankment? Well, that's okay. We can still get really really creative with our geometries to come up with and use superposition to get our induced vertical stresses. So for instance, what if I wanted this point beneath the toe of one of my embankments? How would I do that? Well, let me give you an example. I would, first of all, do an embankment that looked like this, where my, my width on the crest of this embankment would equal that dimension. And then this dimension here a would be my ramp load. Okay, so you're thinking, well, that makes sense, but Dr. Frankie, you just totally overcounted this portion of the rectangle. How do we get rid of it? Well, you're right, we have to subtract it out. And the way that we're going to subtract it out is I want you to imagine an embankment load that looks like this, but the only difference is the width B of the crest is equal to zero. So the only thing we have is a ramp. So A is not equal to zero, but B is equal to zero for this particular triangle. And I know it looks like it's upside down, this one that I'm shading here on the bottom, but it's the same area, it gives me the same stresses. So I would just subtract that rectangle. Now you may be thinking to yourself, wait a second, Dr. Frankie, is it possible for B to equal zero? Yeah, absolutely. Look, here's an option for B over Z equals zero. So I would just use this contour line to get the stresses from that little triangle ramp load that I was subtracting out. Interestingly, you may also note that there is an option for an infinite crest width. So that's how I would get my influence factors uh, for a ramp load beneath the toe of the embankment. Okay, so um, here's an easy one for you to tackle. How would you draw your ramp loads to compute the stress beneath uh, either the center or maybe just a little bit off center beneath the embankment? Take a minute, draw how your different ramp loads would look and see if you get the right answer I do. Go. Okay, so I'm back. Hopefully you had a chance to sketch out what your two ramp loads would look like to get the stresses at this point for the second example. Here's what I did. First, I drew a ramp load that looks like that. That's going to be my ramp load number one. And I get the induced stresses from that, and then I get the induced stresses for ramp number two. And I would simply add the influence factor from um, the first ramp to the influence factor from the second ramp. And I would multiply those by Q to get my change in stress in the Z direction. Looks like a two, but that's a Z. Okay, now here's the tricky one. And this one's going to test you a little bit, but I want you to think about it. Here I have essentially a strip load. It's just a, uh, a rectangular, infinitely long load, and I want to know the stresses beneath the edge of it. Can I use embankment or ramp loads to do this? The answer is yes. Take a minute and find out and see what, what you would do to get the stress beneath the edge of this load. Okay, hopefully you're back and you had a chance to try this out. Here's what I did. I just drew a ramp load that had a really, really small a dimension for the ramp. Now if you go and look at those isobar solutions you'll find that A, whoops I'm not sure why that deleted, A cannot equal zero on those solutions. 
there, it, it's not impossible because it's drawn on a logarithmic plot. But we can get an A dimension that is really, really small. So what does that mean? That means that we are getting a little bit extra stress from that really, really small ramp that doesn't actually exist. But look where my point is. My point is way far away from that. So in reality, it's going to be really negligible induced stresses that I'm predicting at my point of interest. And some of you may say, well, Dr. Frankie, why wouldn't you just apply the solution for a strip load uh, to this problem? And I would say, great job. Yep, you're absolutely right. Just apply a strip load and you'll get this about the same answer. The point I'm trying to make is that you can get about the same answer using this ramp approach as you would using the strip load approach. Your influence factor I should be about the same thing. Okay, well that's the end of our lesson today. Um, you're going to have a fun time practicing these Boussinet rectangles, especially beneath the corners, of the, the, the rectangles beneath the corners. You're going to have a fun time using those on your homework. Remember folks, I always have several students who end up trying to apply the rectangles or, or, or apply the points beneath the center of the rectangles. Don't make that mistake. Line up your rectangles such that the corners all align with your point of interest. You want to get the stresses beneath the corner of your rectangle. Good luck with your assignment and thank you for your attention. I look forward to seeing you guys next week. Have a wonderful day.